back for more. You know, we don't, with the, with the possible exception of the fact that you both have really good football teams, um, <laughs> even though the season ended in somewhat different ways, um, we don't usually think of the similarities between Boston uh, and Alabama. They're very different places in every way, starting with the accents, as I think we're going to hear soon enough. Uh, but in each case, local leaders decided that expanding access to pre-K instruction was important enough to invest in. In Alabama, that's meant the first class program. In Boston, K-1. I want, want to start uh, maybe by explaining to everyone here a little bit about what each of you are doing. And as important, how you built the political consensus and political coalition to invest the dollars that you did. Gina? Start in well, Alabama. in Alabama, we are expanding access to the first class pre-K. That is a model. It's a framework for a uh, four-year-old program. Uh, we've gotten consensus in the legislature about communication, communication, mm -hmm. communication, and being able to show evidence and uh, outcomes that this program does work. And we're actually seeing uh, achievement gap closures all the way up to 29% into the sixth grade. So when you go with a strong uh, evidence-based uh, program and they're willing to, to fund it. Sure. Um, I think Boston is joining several cities who've had to take the lead on, on pre-K. And so our story is a 12-year journey, starting with Mayor Menino, who said back in 2005, we've got to expand pre-K. His focus was access, but you follow that maybe two or three years later, and we're looking at the first evaluative evidence that says, wait a minute, we aren't having the intended impact mm -hmm. uh, here. And so that's when Boston <coughs> got very serious about quality and identifying a set of conditions that we knew we had to set forth. Now, he started in the public schools, and we quickly learned about the challenges that that created for community-based providers. So the second part of the story is really about the work that we've done to create a mixed delivery system, first by investing ourselves, but secondly through the federal pre-K mm. expansion grants uh, over the last couple of years. And now the system that we're proposing is a mixed delivery system where families can access high-quality uh, four-year-old pre-K wherever they want it. We're going to talk a little bit more of that mixed delivery in a minute. But let me, let me go back. Let's talk a little bit about kind of the, the way in which you fund this and the way in which you built the, the audience for uh, providing that funding. Because, you know, Alabama, you know, frankly, is not a state that has, that has invested a lot in a lot of these areas. Your boss, the governor, yes. took a lot of heat a few months ago when he said, our education system in this state sucks. That's the governor. Yeah, um, but it is a different story in early childhood where you uh, are uh, you know, in the national forefront. I believe under Governor Bentley, you have more than tripled the number of students in the first, K, in the first class pre-K program. So what made this different than many of the other areas of spending on young children that have faced a more skeptical audience in the legislature? What, what, what's been the difference about this? Well, I think because we had an incremental expansion over the years, the first classrooms were funded in 2000, 2001 as a pilot, eight pilot sites, mm -hmm. then up to 35. Today, we have 815. So that incremental expansion and grassroots building of a program from the beginning, mm -hmm. we had actually uh, Alabama early childhood education professionals write standards, early learning standards. We've created program guidelines, classroom guidelines, which include coaching, strong monitoring system, and it's all about high quality. Yeah, you know, uh, when you look at, I, when reading about the, the coalition that supports what you're doing, you, the Alabama School Readiness Alliance, and it includes places you'd expect, advocacy organization like Voices for Alabama's Children, uh, uh, but it also includes the regional presidents of PNC Bank, Mm -hmm. the CEO of the Tuscaloosa Chamber of Commerce and the executive vice president of the Alabama Power Company. How important was business in building the coalition and building the consensus to do this? And what did it take to enlist business in supporting an idea like this? Business is very important because with the businesses, you also have that local community understanding as well. Um, so that started with just, again, a group of strong advocates for pre-K that understood that this is something that Alabama needed and that the parents wanted, and uh, being able to meet with uh, business people. And this, this actual, this Alabama School Readiness Alliance is huge. Uh, the way that they have worked together, uh, we've got the Business Council of Alabama that's working with them as well, and leaders uh, that understand that the economic outcomes later on or what they would like to see. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk a little about the institutions, the institutional support 
in Boston for what you were doing, both politically and, uh, uh, I guess, operationally. Sure. Uh, what are the groups that have really been involved in kind of building the consensus? So this has really had to be uh, grassroots work. Uh, even though the public schools have been a leader on this, we're thinking about uh, our health care systems, uh, in part because especially as we think about zero to three, it's really intersectional systems work, thinking about how you support the child and the family, mm -hmm. as well as what early learning and early care uh, looks like. We had to make sure that we had providers like Head Start and our independent CBOs uh, as a part of this, as well as our higher ed infrastructure, many of whom think about what quality and excellence in the early learning space looks like. And so it's really been an ecosystem uh, effort, I would say, in contrast. We haven't had as much uh, business support or business focus on this. Uh, oftentimes, K-12 to is the name of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we're trying to do is really elevate the importance of early learning because it's where a lot of the evidence of effectiveness lives about early achievement gap closure, and it's where we need to double down. You know, we're talking about a, a city program in Boston, a state program in Alabama. I think yes. it would surprise a lot of people that Massachusetts, you know, blue Massachusetts, mm -hmm. there's a pretty minimal statewide pre-K effort, I believe only 7%. Yes. Of the of the state's uh, four year olds uh, are in um, a state state free free uh, no cost state provided mm -hmm. uh, pre K and you have gone to the state before asking for funds yes. and 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 been rebuffed. Talk a little bit now about how you are seeking to fund this program and do you think it's going to be a different reaction? Sure, a little context setting uh, first. There is a great amount of interest in the legislature and I would say in the governor's office for pre-K and something that looks like uh, universal. I think that there may be uh, competing but compatible ideas about how mm -hmm. to do that at the state level. But it's important to understand that on an annual basis, we are still fighting for full day kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So the question about how we get to universal pre-K is a big question. So what we're proposing to do is to tap convention center funds in Massachusetts to fund universal pre-K in Boston. Our proposal is this. Uh, the convention center sits in Boston. It generates about a $60 million surplus uh, each year. The greater proportion of that surplus is generated in the city of Boston. We are looking to tap two line items in that surplus. One is car rental outside of our airport, as well as sightseeing, our trolley tours, mm. duck boat tours. <clears throat> we think that that would net us about $16.5 million to support universal pre-K and still leave the convention center the better part of the surplus. Uh, to do its work, or the state, the better part of the surplus, uh, to fill budget gaps as it often has in the past. But we think that that's a fairly constant uh, surplus. Why has it been so hard, so difficult to get the funding in the past? Is there a non-urban reluctance to fund something in the biggest city in the state? Well, uh, the dynamics of Massachusetts are such that uh, whether it's real or perceived, Boston gets everything. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's... Uh, you know, a uh, Boston versus the rest of the state. And, and we do need to consider equity uh, in terms of resource allocation uh, around the state of Massachusetts. But I would argue uh, both statewide, regionally, and nationally, if we're going to get to outsized breakthroughs in pre-K, Boston is one of the mm -hmm. places that's going to do it. And I think it's in the best interest of the state to recognize that and invest. In Alabama, Gina, has there been a dedicated source of funding or has it just come out of general revenue? Uh, no, it's a dedicated source of funding. It comes out of the Education Trust Fund budget. Alabama has two budgets. They have a general fund and they have an education fund. So it's a line item in the Education Trust Fund budget, but we also, through these, uh, the way we give the funds out through a competitive grant, we have a 25% match. So the communities do also mm -hmm provide 25% of the cost of the program. You have, um, you have uh, put a lot of chips in this basket in Alabama. I believe that funding has gone from 19 million in 2012 yes. to 65 million in 2016. And, and we'll talk in a moment about further expansion, but before we look forward, why, out of all of the things that you can invest in in education, in that education mm -hmm. trust budget, why put so many chips down on this one idea? Well, because it works. And we, we've been able to show some outcomes. Uh, our legislature is very interested in the evidence. They want to know that it has an impact and that the tax dollars are being spent for something that really matters. So we continually evaluate and research the program. We're continually improving it. But all, with all that said, we have to be able to show that it matters to the and, children and do you families. feel that it is it is a more effective use of each dollar than an intervention at other points in the in the child's educational you know 
uh, progression, uh, third grade, eighth grade, people talk about these different, you know, these different critical moments. Mm -hmm. why, why the early childhood over those later points? Well, we know that if we can get the children off to a good start with a strong foundation, those interventions may not be needed. I spent 20 years in public mm -hmm. education before um, I went into this position and uh, as an at-risk coordinator. So I have seen the other interventions and I understand them and I know there's a need for them. But uh, working with the students that I worked with over the years, I can tell you that that early start would have mattered a lot. Not just in the rote academic pieces, but in that love of learning and the uh, soft skills, that those, those other pieces that are so important that if you can catch that last year before that, mm. while that brain, before it hits that point to where it's 95% developed. But if we can catch that and close that gap and provide those types of experiences that a child needs to be able to have self-regulation and a confidence that in themselves. I want to ask you the same question, Ron, because you, you're at about, in Boston, I believe you're at 90% of four-year-olds are in some kind of program, but yes. only about half of them in the public uh, yes. programs. So why put more dollars into, into pushing that number up higher as opposed to other aspects? You, you have a broad education portfolio mm -hmm. that you're looking at. Why is this where you want to put your dollars? So uh, one, we've estimated that every dollar invested in early learning is about a seven dollar return um, so that that's a good bet measured uh, in what what kind of uh, how do you measure that uh, well thinking about long-term savings on the other end what we don't have to do in terms of remediation uh, in the early grades uh, certainly uh, disciplinary and sometimes juvenile justice uh, costs uh, that may uh, occur inside and outside of school so I think we're trying to think about total savings uh, when we think about mm -hmm. that investment. The other piece of this is that Mayor Walsh uh, lives by the value that if we get to young people and families early, it really mitigates uh, a lot of problems. It's not a bad value to live by, and I think the evidence justifies a lot of that. Let's talk about quality, because in Alabama, you have grown, as we're talking about, you've put a lot more money in. You were at 119 classrooms in 2012, 816 classrooms now. Yes. How have you, how difficult is it to maintain a, a common standard of quality while expanding that much, and as you say, giving a lot of authority to the local providers. How do you try to maintain the quality? Well, we spend a lot of time with professional development, not only for the teachers, uh, but for the directors, the people that uh, are actually overseeing the programs. We also provide a coach and this coach goes into the classrooms. It's a tiered coaching model. So if we see a refined teacher that uh, seems to have her uh, instructional practice, her adult child interactions on a, on a level mm -hmm. that we think is the, the highest quality, um, we may not spend as much time. But if we have a struggling teacher or a new teacher, we may have a coach in a classroom as much as twice a week. So they're side by side hmm. working with them and helping them through this. And even with all that, how much variation do you see in the quality? Your sense of still is well, it still substantial. There, it, it depends on the location. Um, we find that our more rural, poor areas uh, have some, in some cases, more struggles. Uh, but uh, we just put more resources there, and we pretty much can balance it out. Uh, but it, when you grow this fast, in the way that we've integrated and blended funds, we've picked up programs that were already existing, but we enhance those. We call it an excellence grant. So in those programs where you've got long established practices, it may take a little longer to kind of turn, steer the ship the other direction, but we're working on it because we want every situation where we've got a four-year-old to be the highest quality we can possibly Ron, I think them. the perception of Boston is pretty much the opposite, that you've grown slowly, but put a real emphasis on maintaining quality. Yes. How, what, what, have, what, have been the, what, what have been the keys to your success in the city about maintaining a kind of standard, a common standard? So I think very similarly, we've invested heavily in professional development and coaching. And so uh, when we got that early evaluative evidence back about the lack of impact uh, early on, we really tried to figure out who are the people who are going to sit with educators uh, in their classrooms on the job and help them understand and calibrate to a certain set of standards. Also, how are we going to make sure that we're investing in the teaching force as well? One of the quality standards is that we want a teacher with a BA or better, and there's a mm. huge disparity between public school uh, and community-based organizations. So part of what we're going to have to do in our system going forward is partner with some of our universities, create a set of incentives and investments 
for those professionals who want to gain uh, advanced degrees. Well, you, you just touched on it again, but earlier you alluded to one of the distinctive aspects of the Boston program, which is that you not only provide it through the public schools, but you yes. work with private providers. Yes. So what are the advantages of that model? What are the challenges? And how does that fit into the, 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 the challenge of maintaining quality? Advantages of the model, first of all, uh, are for the parent. So now we're able to offer quality in the settings that parents want to use most. We've had parents tell us that I'm not quite ready for my four-year-old to enter the school door yet. I'd rather have them in the neighborhood or close to my job. So we're able to offer that uh, for them. I think some of the challenges have been that uh, we hear from community providers. They want to maintain some level of uh, flexibility. Mm -hmm. They don't want to just replicate what Boston Public Schools has done. There's something special about their settings. Many of them are already providing similar quality. And so where we are uh, requiring a formal curriculum, does it have to be the BPS curriculum? No. Um, where we are asking that you use data and that uh, you do coaching and professional development, does it have to be exactly the same way that the system does? Not really. Uh, but we want to make sure that there is strict alignment between kind of the principles at the core of the curriculum and, and of the teaching approach. The advantage that community-based organizations also have is that they do a bang-up job on uh, parent engagement. And I would say they have a lot to teach the public school system mm. uh, about that. Secondly, they offer more learning time. The day is extended. We're talking about a free six-and-a-half-hour day, 180 days per year, but our community-based providers offer extended day up to 10 hours, and they also offer summer programming. So we're going to have to figure out a system by which uh, that extended learning time is offered to all families. So out of the new money, the new, the, the, the additional students that you're expecting, the kids that you're expecting to enroll, how do you divide it between the public schools and the private providers? Is it, where, where are you going to put, uh, channel the new resources? So I, I would say probably the better part of investment, again, I think you have to recognize that 90% of our children are in settings are already. So the choices mm -hmm. have been made mm -hmm. by and large. What we have to invest in is quality both in, in schools. So and, the goal is not to shift more of the, if it's a 50-50 now split from private and public, you're, you're not hoping to shift that further toward the public or the private. You're, you're no, basically it, okay. It, it may happen naturally. It may happen because of some structural challenges. If we want to create more K-1 seats in the public school system, there probably needs to be more school building space for it. And there is not in the short term yeah. or not a lot of it. <clears throat> So uh, we want to make sure that uh, we are making the necessary investments in our community providers. Gene, I want to ask you one, one kind of a, uh, an analogous question. <clears throat> I was looking at a map that mm -hmm. showed the variation by county mm -hmm. in Alabama in access to the program. There are counties where 70 or 80 percent of the four-year-olds are already enrolled in the programs, and others were in single digits. What explains that level of disparity, and is it something that you think the state ultimately has to address to get a more uniform, especially since the governor said his goal is that yes. every child yes. will have access in the next two years. Well, every child whose parents Want choose it. for them right. to participate. will have access yes. at least. Yes, will have access. Right. Well, uh, because it's a competitive grant process, that's part of it. Uh, but we do target those areas where we do feel that the access is lower. And so, like in this next grant cycle, which is starting in immediately, uh, we will look at those areas that are still in the single digits. But you have to understand, too, like in uh, particularly in Wilcox County. So that's been recognized as one of the poorest counties in the country. So we went in, and you'll see that they've got almost 100% access. Well, there's only 234-year-olds mm. in that county. Mm. So that's a little different when you go into somewhere like Jefferson County or Mobile, where you've got the largest four-year-old population in the state. So a lot of it, you know, the percentages are a little uh, off because of the number of children. Um, I want to bring in the audience in a moment. Let me ask you to get through a couple of things quickly. The, the speaker of the, of the Massachusetts House mm -hmm. said in February, we're facing a 30% turnover rate in the EEC workforce. It's mm -hmm. a workforce in crisis, not the only state yes. where a public leader would say that. How hard is retention, and how are you trying to deal with that, that Retention challenge? is difficult, and I think what uh, Speaker DeLeo recognized is that for some of our teaching force, uh, early learning work is low wage work, and that's completely unacceptable. And so what we've got to figure out are some strategies around compensation equalization. And if we are going to require a BA or better, we've got to invest in that teaching workforce as well. So as a part of our city plan, we are really thinking about what the strategy for that compensation equalization looks like. But I hope that Speaker DeLeo will also be a partner in figuring mm -hmm. this out uh, at a statewide level. Same issue? 
Is it compensation um, primarily? Well, we uh, in the state of Alabama last year just made an across the board decision that every first class pre-K teacher would be paid the same as their counterpart in K-12. So we did supplemental grants, uh, salary grants. We did that separate from their base grant to make sure that that money did go to the teachers. Now, as far, and we actually worked in a step raise. Our uh, public school system has step raises, so we've uh, hmm. calculated that in as well. Now, we could not backtrack because there's been some pre-K teachers that have been doing this for 10 years or more, mm -hmm. so we could not go back, but we started from that point forward. So at least that helps a lot. We're also, of course, we require the bachelor's degree at least. And so with that, and we also require a CDA or better nine hours of child development mm. for our auxiliary or assistant teachers. But with that, we also offer scholarships. We have a lot of elementary teachers that are suddenly very interested, particularly in the uh, instructional approach that they feel so strongly about. So now uh, if they do not have the uh, nine hours of child development, we are also doing scholarships for that so that they can get them and be a pre-K teacher. So we're building our workforce as we go. Final subject area before I bring in the audience, federal role and what mm -hmm. federal government could do to help you. We saw two approaches in the presidential campaign. We heard one of them before from uh, Representative Castro. One says federal government should provide m matching grants to states mm -hmm. to create more access. Um, the other, the President Trump has talked about tax credits or deductions for families so that they would have more buying power uh, to go out and, and, and purchase uh, child care or early childhood education. Would he, what, your, your sense of either of those, either of those alternatives make a difference in what you're doing? So the buying power with tax credits isn't necessarily an investment in quality. So one of the things that I think federal and state <clears throat> government needs to do is invest in the elements of quality that we know produce results uh, for children. Uh, if we are able to make those quality options then free uh, for parents, it opens up uh, the world. Uh, there are a couple of things that I think the federal government uh, needs to pay attention to. We've got a Head Start reauthorization coming up uh, pretty soon, and I think the, the request is to fund at about $9.6 billion. We've got to take that reauthorization seriously in Boston if something happens to the Head Start uh, network, we backtrack uh, mm -hmm. on quality and we backtrack on access. We can't afford to do that. The pre-expansion uh, development and pre-expansion, uh, pre-K expansion grant program was great for Massachusetts. It targeted our gateway communities, targeted Boston, the communities inside of those cities uh, that were most deeply affected by access and quality issues as well. What the pre-K expansion grant program did was put quality front and center in the regs, it said, these are the conditions. It has to be mixed delivery. And we've created a system by which we're not just uh, testing whether quality matters. That, that train left the station a long time ago. We know that quality matters. What this is a laboratory for is for the systems building. Uh, and mm -hmm. so we need to continue to learn about how, how do we build the local and state systems to do pre-K work, high quality pre-K work at scale. Gina. Um, well, the federal, you know, we have a preschool development grant, and so we have used those funds very strategically in that we would fund brand new programs from scratch, mostly, and so for one year. Then we would, so that we didn't have a funding cliff at the end, we would then ask the state legislature for enough funds to move those federal funded classrooms into state funded, and then we offer more brand new federal mm -hmm. classrooms. So each year we have been able to provide at least 100 new classrooms with our federal funds and then have the grant the uh, state the next year provide the additional funds to sustain those as well as provide some other little state grants so as is well. So do you think there is a case for a federal matching grant that would be available to all states? I do. You do? I do. I, it, it, but I think that it would have to be uh, carefully thought out uh, because I know that every state, particularly with a preschool development grant, they're not doing it the same mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So I think that it would need to be a, a new emphasis on truly expanding access to high quality programs. Mm -hmm. All right, let's bring in the audience for a couple questions. We got microphones. Do we have questioners? Anyone? Oh, yep, over there. And one in the front, too. Okay. Um, hi. Hi, Gina. How are you? 
Um, so we've talked a lot about pre-K in, in, in the morning and, and the increase in policymakers' interest, both local and state and even federal, at funding these kinds of programs. Can you guys talk about more of the zero to three age range yeah. and what, um, sure. uh, how do we transfer the, those, that kind of political interest and then support to that age group? So that's where a lot of the access and quality yeah. issues are really And that's when you're expanding into, is it, is it right? And well, the way, because we have the diverse delivery system and that we are providing the four-year-old programs into the childcare community, we're able to then go in and provide professional development We've also provided access to our uh, developmental assessment, which teaches those child care providers uh, child development, which I think is huge. When they have an understanding of that, they, they, they have a greater um, uh, understanding of, of how a child, adult child interaction should look like and what those experiences should be in those uh, child care provider uh, situations. Uh, we are also looking to, uh, with to partner with our Department of Human Resources who holds our child care licensing program. They also have an early Head Start uh, child care grant, federal grant. And I can see a lot of uh, good potential in that as far as the quality of child care and uh, being able to offer professional development and resources and support for the child care community. A couple of things to, to think about. One, I think zero to three is perhaps a different set of challenges than, than pre-K. I think where we are with pre-K now is really a, a program expansion and consistency and quality issue. There's also that, that challenge in zero to three, but zero to three is also an economic development challenge. Uh, the business models that predominate in zero to three are very fragile business mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm. So we've got to invest again in the compensation equalization. What small businesses are paying in the way of back office is burdening them. So we have to figure out what are the collectives that we create to make them more sustainable. I think it's where business can play uh, a great role for us. And then there's the intersectional work because uh, early care and a lot of zero to three work uh, overlaps with the healthcare system. It overlaps with uh, family services in some ways where we're gonna have to figure out what that meta system work or that ecosystem work looks like. Uh, I co-convene a birth to eight table uh, in Boston right now that is about 60 uh, organizations really trying to think about what is the seamless system from birth all the way through mm -hmm. early elementary. And we've started to create a metrics framework that will start to harmonize some of the work that gets done across sector, but also recognize some of the gains that we've made in pre-K in terms of what we know about quality. One more. Antoine Wallace from the Center of, for Urban Families in Baltimore. Can you say a little bit about the policy scripts that you've written in terms of thinking about who pays and where the benefits actually accrue, that is the space where the federal government might uh, take its cues from local mm -hmm. government about being able to develop out what the federal investment might look like. That's a very interesting question, because I, I, I think the script that we've written in some ways is very uh, Boston specific. Now, we've learned from Philadelphia, we've learned from Seattle uh, and, and some other places uh, I think because we've had to get so creative around the resourcing because Boston doesn't have independent taxable authority from the state. So we've had to figure out where an existing revenue we were going to pull some things from. But I think uh, what can be taken from what we've done is the emphasis on quality. And I, I sense that there is a reluctance at the federal level to again lead on education from a standards-based uh, perspective. But I, I would caution that uh, leadership from that perspective can go a long way in the early learning space. And of course, uh, there is a lot of critique to be had about the standards movement uh, or whatever. But I think when you have a strong framework and a strong evidence base, it's the place to begin uh, the script. All right. Well, this has been terrific. We, we could go on all morning. But I think uh, join me in thanking Gina Ross and Ron Dorsey um, and Margaret. I think you have some final words for us.